Selamat pagi. This is Arlene from Durian ASEAN. Today we have a very special guest from SME Magazine. His name is Datuk William Ng. Yeah, hello, Island. Good morning. Yes. Yeah, morning. <laughs> and he's he's the uh, group publisher and editor in chief of SME Magazine. Today he will share about the regional opportunities for SME Expo, which is the largest Southeast Asian trade show for SMEs. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So first of all, um, the SME Magazine. Maybe you can um, you know let us know what is the background on what is it about. Well, we started. The SME magazine back in the year 2007 um, as a medium for SMEs to learn more about um, the market as well as opportunity for them as well as what else they can do to improve themselves. Since then, the SME magazine has grown into a regional publication. Um, we are now um, in Indonesia, in Brunei, in Singapore. Um, the first regional edition is back in 2009, um, and, and that is the Indonesia edition. Um, and of course, um, we have then evolved into a uh, larger um, publication company. Uh, we now have the Asia Asia magazine, again a regional magazine, um, under our um, stable. Uh, we have also launched the Capital Asia uh, about three and a half years back. Um, so as a magazine, uh, we're one of the very few publications in the region that is truly regional. Uh, we now have a, as I've said, an Indonesian edition in Basa, Indonesia, catering to the uh, Indonesian market. Uh, we have the Brunei edition, we have the Singapore edition, and all these are localized uh, edition with local contents, uh, local contributors, and local interviews. I see. And in the Malaysian context, is it the best-selling uh, SME magazine? Um, since we have since we were launched, we were quite fortunate um, that our readership has been very stable. Um, SMEs in general, both um, established ones as well as those who are up and coming, has been very supportive. Um, so yes, over the past few years, uh, we have been the top selling uh, business magazine in the country. And um, in Singapore, uh, we had a clear number two. In Indonesia, um, we also number two. Um, but uh, closing the gap uh, very fast with a very strong established leader in the market that's been around in Indonesia for the past 40 years um, so we have done well uh, overall as a title yeah, I see so uh, for SME in general uh, why uh, you started this SME magazine in the first place what is your mo- what was the mat- motivation for it I think as an as an entrepreneur and as a SME owner uh, even during that time myself I felt that there was a um, a lack at a point of a medium to assist and help SMEs um, to start, to grow, and to sustain themselves. And I thought that you know it would be a good idea to have a publication that address those issues. I see. So, uh, as an entrepreneur yourself, what do you see the current state of SME in Malaysia? Um, I think we have seen enough. Um, in, in the media, in the news, that um, the country is taking SMEs very seriously. Uh, the SMEs play a, a very important part uh, in the new economic model, in, in us wanting and our ambition to be a um, fully developed country. Um, so yes, uh, SME is a very exciting um, sector to be, to be in right now. All of a sudden, there's a lot of focus on small and medium enterprises, when in the past, it's always been about Companies that are that are large, um, and yeah, the MNC, even, right? Yeah, right? So the focus is now shifted um, in Malaysia um, to SMEs, but it's not something that is unique in Malaysia. Uh, throughout the whole region, in Thailand, in Singapore, in Indonesia, in Brunei, SME is playing an extremely important part. Um, in in Brunei, for example, there's now a very healthy government-led initiative to power startups in Brunei so that's to diversify the economy from the traditional oil and gas industry into into downstream industries. Not just downstream oil and gas industry, but uh, food manufacturing, um, trading services, SMEs in general. Uh, in Singapore, uh, just a month and a half ago, uh, if, if you have been following the budget um, in Singapore, uh, the focus again has been um, to grow SMEs, uh, indigenous SMEs uh, in Singapore. Um, obviously, if you if you if you read into the into the budget, um, the CDG or the Capability Development Grant um, has been um, um, intensified 
uh, for Singaporean SMEs. So yes, regionally, um, SMEs are the focus for governments. And I think that's, that's literally so. Um, because as we grow um, as an economy regionally, um, there has to be more and more SMEs to support that growth. Uh, it can't just be um, regional players. There has to be a, a layer of support, uh, of supplies, of vendors, of people to service uh, these MSCs that we're growing uh, of our own base. Besides individual country and individual government supporting these SMEs, what about Southeast Asian, uh, sorry, what about ASEAN? Uh, the, the regional body ASEAN, uh, does it provide some sort of like uh, support or mechanism for these SMEs to grow? I think there were attempts uh, in the past and even now to link the SMEs among the different countries. Um, but unfortunately, of course, uh, governments have priorities and a lot of these linkages um, are not uh, at the top of the priority. Most governments and ours uh, in Malaysia, including are very much focused on the capability, capability uh, building right now. I think that is uh, phase one. And moving forward, I think linkages is going to happen. Um, at SME Magazine and at Business Media International, uh, our focus really is to help close that gap. Uh, we have already started um, putting those linkages together in all the events, in all the initiatives, in all the programs that we organize uh, each year. Uh, we try as much as we can to pull in um, SMEs across the whole region um, so that these linkages and these um, uh, SMEs, SMEs connection between countries can happen uh, independent of the government. I see. When it comes to Malaysia, uh, it is stated that the government is targeting for small and medium enterprises, which is SME, to contribute 40% for the country's GDP by 2015, which is only next year, uh, via inter- dynamic entrepreneurs, as in entrepreneurs... They, it seems like they want to cultivate more and more entrepreneurs. So, and he, he stated that the current contribution is only at 33%. Um, what is your view on this? I mean, you're part of this group of SMEs, entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you have your own strategy or views. I think obviously we, we are the right track. Um, for us to move forward as a country, we absolutely have to diversify the um the sectors that we are we are strong in, we need to put more focus on sectors that has been weak in the past. And at what the same are the time, sectors that have been weak? Um, one of the areas that we have been lagging behind, um, only as recent as um, several years back, are uh, in the um, services and um, industrial support sectors. Um, in in the eighties and nineties, we have always been strong uh, in manufacturing. And I think we have um, shifted from that into the services sector. Um, and, and SMEs has been leading in that sense. So to grow um, the SME sector from the current um, 33% to 40% is something that is right. And I think we are on track uh, to do that. Uh, one of the things that the government has done um, uh, beginning 1st January uh, 2014 is to uh, double up um, the definition of SMEs. So in the past, um, the SMEs were limited by the, um, by the turnover and by the number of staff. We've doubled that, um, that definition so as to have a broader base of SMEs, um, to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about regionally? As in like, um, uh, is there any, uh, expectation on what kind of percentage of, of growth that maybe, um, the ASEAN uh, countries, you know, as a whole, is uh, expected to grow. I think I, I don't have the numbers, but um, every country in the region mm-hmm. um, are putting a lot more focus on SMEs than they have um, a, a mere, say, five to ten years back. Um, in Indonesia, for example, there is now a dedicated ministry. Um, um, uh, we call it the Ministry of U- UKM um, that supports and develops SMEs. That is how much. Um, uh, impact SMEs are making uh, mm-hmm. in governance across the region. I see. What are the key challenges that SMEs are facing right now and also entrepreneurs? I think in, in, in general, um, that would differ from country to country. Um, what about in Malaysia first? In, in Malaysia, I would mm-hmm. say that the top four challenges, and this is common actually across all countries, mm-hmm. is that the proportion of the challenges are different from country to country. And I would say that these are the, uh, the challenges of finance, of technology, of market access, and of talent. Yeah, and especially technology. I, I'm not sure how uh, 
much the technology have grew, as in the R and D and all, in uh, Southeast Asia. Maybe you might have some views on that. I think we we all know that um, the the whole world um, is being technology led these days. Um, if you fall behind in how you use technology, um, you, you're basically behind, and that, that that's it. You know, um, a lot of SMEs do not have problem uh, understanding this technology, but uh, many have problem accessing to this technology uh, because of cost, um, because of the technical know-how required um, to operate this technology, as well as having the right people to do and manage this technology. Mm-hmm. Um, cloud, of course, has has changed the. The game quite a fair bit, um, have made um, technology more accessible to a lot of people. Um, but we're still in early days when it comes to access of technology for, for SMEs. And that and also um, access to, to technology in the sense of research and new developments. Um, many owners and creators of technologies um, obviously do not um, target the SMEs first and foremost. Uh, that's not where the money is. Um, very few we would want to collaborate in terms of technology transfer to smaller companies because of um, a perceived lack of uh, uh, reliability, um, because of size and, and age of the businesses. Um, so as a result, it is very difficult for SMEs to acquire um, uh, trailblazing technologies um, that they can use um, in the operations. Mm, okay. Um, so um, I think we can go towards... Uh put a focus on the XME Expo, which is sure. it's called SME Solution Expo. That's right. Um, the Expo is six years old now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we started the SME Expo back in 1999, uh, sorry, uh, two, 2009, um, with the purpose to have a one-stop stop for SMEs to, to buy, to understand, to discover new products and services for their businesses. And since then, it has grown uh, to what it is today, uh, one of the largest um, expo for SMEs uh, in Malaysia and regionally. Mm. So this, this year, the expo will be held um, on from the 13th to 15th uh, August at the uh, Mid Valley Exhibition Center. I see. What can people expect? Like, uh, and who are you targeting this expo for? Besides, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. Obviously, we we are targeting the SMEs uh, mm. and would be entrepreneurs at the same time. Uh, this year, our team is called uh, from the grounds up. Uh, really because we, we strongly believe that uh, the issue is not about creating more SMEs. The issue is not about starting a business. The, the the real issue here is how do you build a sustainable business over time? And that has to be done from ground up. Um, so the people that we are bringing in uh, as exhibitor um, for the expo comprises people who are able to help on, in that sense. We have bankers who are coming on board. We have logistic companies who are coming on board to help um, um uh, proper raw and delivery. We have people who are uh, um, operating call centers um, to help out. Uh, we have telcos who are coming in with the uh, uh, telecommunication lu- solutions. Mm-hmm. We have got a uh, web company to provide mm-hmm. web hosting, um, social media services, and so on. I see. Uh, just curious about uh, when you come when you say it about helping businesses. So prior to this, if uh, an entrepreneur wanting to start a business without all this instrument f- to help. It is just, uh, I'm curious to know, um, what is the general success rate, uh, of, you know, uh, startup companies? I- is it like, you know, they have higher failures or higher I, success rate? I, I think it has been a, um, long standing rule of thumb that mm-hmm. for every 10 businesses that start up, uh, only one will survive beyond the first one year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is very true, uh, whether it's in Malaysia or, or in any other country, uh, regional, uh, regionally. And one of the reasons for that is because a lot of us, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs for that matter, um, become entrepreneurs because they're interested in something. They have one product they feel that the world needs and everybody thinks so. Um, very little, very little research, uh, is usually done, if at all. Uh, and many of these people have the expertise to create a product, but do not have the full expertise to run the entire operations of, of being in a business. Um, that, that has always been the case uh, now and, 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 and in the future as well. Um, so there's a knowledge gap there. There's a know-how gap there. And what we hope to achieve why the SME Solution Expo is to um, close the gap by providing the information that is required for both startups as well as established businesses to run the operational uh, operations smoothly. At the same time, to provide the right products and services for them to consider. 
um, in the past, um, somebody would have to learn either from um, their past employment, from the friends, families, and so on, uh, what they would require to succeed succeed in the business. But not everybody has that opportunity and that um, that uh, good luck to have a mentor to guide them. Um, so what we want to to do at the expo really is to is to provide that role. Yeah, and also when it comes to uh, you know building a business, I think the m- number one obstacle is finance. Uh, you usually they would either um, you know go to their friends or their family, or you know whoever that is close to them. But I think uh, with the SME a Solution Expo, you provide a much you know larger financial mechanism. In. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think uh, Lynn, that's. Um, uh, most people, especially would-be entrepreneurs, uh, find that going into business um, challenging. Uh, first and foremost, because there's this perceived uh, requirement for um, for big capital. Uh, if you don't have money to start up a business, you don't start a business. That has always been um, what people assume. Um, but if you ask any successful entrepreneur today who have started off from scratch, um, I would say um, 9 out of 10, uh, if not more, would tell you that finance is the least of their worry. Uh, mm-hmm. It's never about money uh, when it comes to starting and running a successful business. Um, I would say eight of um, out of ten of these people will tell you the biggest challenge of starting a business is really the people. So it's not the money. Um, so yes, um, at the Simple Solution Expo, we provide uh, more than just help on money, but also help on uh, access to market, access to technology, and of course, ultimately also to people. Mm, okay. Uh- Maybe you want to add more on what can we expect at the expo itself? It's a three-day expo, right? We have um, a very exciting um, SME summit uh, Mm -hmm. each year, uh, always full house. Uh, (laughs) Last year, we had close to 350 people. Uh, We have to stop people from from registering registering a week uh, before the event. Uh, So so do come. Uh, Especially This is very important, especially Mm -hmm. for those who, who, who are new in business. Or, or has been in business for the for the short while. I need to relearn um, some of the things. We have got um, great speakers, people who are not just um, experienced hand in in running businesses, but also consultants, uh, people who are uh, domain expert in the respective industries, mm-hmm. respective segments. Um, so it's absolutely important uh, for people to come and and listen. Um, the access to the SME summit is free, but mm-hmm. you have to be a SME uh, owner, mm-hmm. uh, preferably the DCO, um, uh, for you to be part of the summit. I see. When you say speakers, what are the speakers that we can expect? Um, we are still finalizing the list of speakers this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but last last year, uh, we had representatives from Smedec. Mm-hmm. We have uh, SME Corp now. Uh, we have representatives from Google, uh, from Yahoo. Uh, we even um, uh, had people from banks um, and so on to provide the information. I see. I see. Uh, interesting. So, um, how can uh, investors, SME entrepreneurs, uh, participate in this event, or even open, t- or if they are interested to open a booth there? The um, visitors can come in for free um, by pre-registration. Uh, do visit our website. It's at uh, uh, smeexpo.asia. That's uh, www.smeexpo.asia. Um, all the information they require is there. You can pre-register there, um, so that we can reserve the space uh, for you uh, either at Summit Summit or or, or just uh, to visit, uh, so you don't have to re-register uh, on site. I see. Okay. Uh, well. Um. So about the regional opportunities uh, at this SME uh, Solution Expo, what are the opportunities uh, that they can expect? You know, when you say regional opportunities, we have a regional hosting program and, and this is open to any SMEs uh, throughout, mm-hmm. throughout ASEAN because that's our focus as well. Um, uh, we provide uh, free accommodation for qualified SMEs to visit the expo um, and to do business matching with uh, SMEs in Malaysia. This has been going on uh, for a number of years. Uh, last year, we have 80 entrepreneurs, uh, a, a majority of which are from Indonesia. Uh, many of these people are our current subscribers and readers uh, and supporters of SME magazine in the respective countries. Um, this year again, uh, we're open to anyone, any SMEs in the region who want to find out ways to link up with uh, other SMEs in the region. Uh, again, do visit our website and uh, download the necessary form, complete it, and uh, we'll try and bring you over. I see. Uh, okay, so we will come back again. Uh, we we'll take a short rest. Colors of Sherry.
Welcome back again uh, in Duran ASEAN. Here we have uh, Datuk William Ng. Um, so, uh, furthering our uh, topic today on the regional opportunities of SME Expo, we want to dwell deeper into the mind of Datuk William Ng, being a seasoned entrepreneur. Uh, so, to begin with, uh, what would you advise to would-be entrepreneurs as Especially people who are very much keen into, you know, starting their own businesses and wanting to know what are the challenges ahead of them. I think, um, first of all, really to learn as much as you can about what you intend to do. Um, if you have no experience in business, then it would make sense to uh, work for another business, uh, whether it's a family business or someone else's business. So you understand the various ropes that are required um, to be successful in business. I think that's absolutely important. But having said that, um, there's really no preparation um, that are good enough to be in business. You just have to do it and learn um, uh, as you go along. I think uh, that's that's true for almost any businesses. Uh, nobody came out expecting um, um, that the business that they have started to be exactly where they are uh, five years down the road. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, changes along the way. Yeah. Um, so really, um, to learn as much as you can and more importantly, be very bold and take that first step. Yeah, and uh, as far as I know, uh, you know, especially in these current times, there's a lot of inspiring stories of uh, startups like, you know, Apple's, uh, Steve yeah. Jobs and also Mark Zuckerberg's uh, Facebook. Um, but it, there's also, the f- you know, a lot of the failure side of uh, startups. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how do you reconcile with this? Like, if, if you look at it, all of a sudden over the past few years, it's a lot of younger people, uh, you know, inspired by the Facebook and so on, uh, that if somebody 20, at the age of 25 can be a billionaire, why can't I? So as a result, a lot of people has gone and jumped into the entrepreneurship bandwagon. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But what people should need to understand is that um, as more and more businesses get started up, the failure rate is also equally high. So people must be prepared to fail. And then there's a very important um, um that uh, attribute that distinguishes a successful entrepreneur and, and one that has failed is that successful entrepreneurs is an entrepreneur that has failed again and again. I think so it's very important for people not to fear failure. Um, failure is really, uh, as they say, very much uh, a lesson in being successful. And you have a very interesting journey as an entrepreneur. And I, I've, I've had my own share of failure. Um, the, the first business that I started off is uh, back in... in um, um, uh, 1999, uh, uh, that's my first business. Um, we were doing, um, uh, events, family days, um, dinners and so on for clients. Uh, I, I was, I was very young at that point. Um, How old? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in my early twenties. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very young, uh, fresh out of school. And I thought, you know, nothing can stop me. I'm on top of the whole world. And, <laughs> and I did okay. I did okay for the, for the short period. And then I felt, Felt mm-hmm. because uh, people stop paying, uh, clients stop paying, um, and and the nature of the business is that you're y- y- always on borrowed money. Um, y- you borrow money from one project to roll out to the next project. So uh, at a very young age, I felt, and I thought that if if you know, uh, I-, I felt doing events for other people, why not do something for myself? Mm-hmm. Um, do our own in-house events, um, uh, and and that's how uh, AIC exhibitions, one of my companies, got started off. Um, so we organized exhibitions. And one of the first that I remember is back in the year 2002 when we organized uh, the largest uh, health show of its kind called the National Health Show. Uh, again, I was in my early 20s at that point. Uh, it, the first one was very successful. We had uh, over 400 booth. I think we did close to 1.5 million uh, ringgit, uh, wow. the, the first project on its own. So again, we thought, you know, we're unbeatable. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we're on top of the world. And, you know, when you're, when you're in your early 20s and you're in millions, you know, mm-hmm. you, you thought a lot of yourself. And again, then we felt. Oh. We felt because um, of SARS in uh, 2003, um, all of a sudden, uh, the whole region, the whole ASEAN, the whole Asia is swamped with um, uh, uh, SARS and exhibitors um, simply refuses to, to take part. You know, why would you want to risk your life by being in the public when you can, you can um, get SARS by, by being exposed uh, out in exhibition? Uh, people pull out um, our deposit with exhibition centers were, were confiscated. Uh, we literally ran our money and must be, have, must have been a hard time. Hard. Uh, we have to sell off uh, properties that we own at the point. We sell our cars. 
Um, we have to retrench people and that was most painful. People who has worked for us for years have to tell them one day and say, look, you know, we can no longer afford to pay you. Mm. Um, we, we have to negotiate with, um, with, um, our suppliers to prolong the payment period. Uh, very painful. So we were close to, to giving everything up, uh, giving up on, mm. on, on, on being a business person. Uh, um, and this is back in 2003. Um, mm. again, we persevered. We learned from, from the lesson, um, that, um, uh, and, and at that point, um, um, we restarted all over again, uh, from scratch again. Um, we were still in exhibition. And, um, I think, um, thankfully because of this perseverance, um, this refusal to give up, um, I think we are, we are doing quite okay, uh, now as an exhibition company, uh, one, one of the, um, the leader regionally, regionally in the exhibition. We have uh, seven or eight exhibitions a year, uh, across the whole region. Uh, every one of them is very productive these days and we, we, we virtually don't have to do anything, uh, much. Um, they, they became brands, um, of their own. Um, so back in 2007, we said, uh, sorry, 2005, mm-hmm. we, I, I decided to, to, to branch out and say, okay, you know, now that we're back in order, let's do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we started a magazine called Five Senses. Uh, mm-hmm. so you talk about spas, they talk about, uh, the new age lifestyle. Um, so we talk about jazz, we talk about, oh, Everything that was uh, popular at that point, again, it became a failure. You know, we failed spectacularly in that mm-hmm. one as well. Simply because we we weren't uh, we didn't realize that at that point back in two thousand five, uh, spas and and to some extent until today, uh, there's a stigma to to the term spa. A lot of people perceive what? that um, stigma. Yeah, a lot oh. of people perceive that uh, spas mean um, hanky panky services. Ah, oh, okay. You know, they, they equate spas with brothels. Especially and, in Southeast Asia where you have Thailand nearby there. <laughs> so, uh, not, not just in Thailand, in Malaysia, in every mm. country that mm-hmm. there's this little social stigma, um, mm. to do with spas. And this is, this is a, a good 10 years mm. ago. Of course, over the years, we've seen a lot of growth, um, um, uh, in that sector. So we were, we were too early at that point. We thought, you know, again, uh, we put in money, we lost everything, and we shut down that, that entire magazine. Um, uh, back in 2005. And then we started SME Magazine, uh, in 2007. And, and, um, partially luck, partially, uh, lessons learned from, uh, from all these failures. Um, you know, SME Magazine has gone on to be a instant success. Uh, we made money from, from, from year one. Mm. Uh, very few magazines make money from, from the start and we did. Uh, and I think that's, um, Probably because of the failures of experience very on, uh, uh, early on in our, uh, our, our business journey. Mm. Um, similarly, we, we now own spas, uh, an opportunity, uh, arise in 2006, uh, for, 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 for a group of spas in Indonesia. Um, they, they weren't doing too well. This was, uh, right after the, uh, the Bali bombing. Um, and a lot of spas were closing down, a lot of hospitality businesses were closing down. And then I thought, hey, you know, there's an opportunity that we could go into. And I, I, I bought up, uh, that spa. And we have since grown that, um, from, from just two outlets. Uh, we now have 12 outlets, 12 spas across, uh, Indonesia, in Bali, in Samarang, and Jakarta. So, um, to some extent, uh, it's opportunity. It is, uh, the ability to stand, um, all these failures and learn from them. Yeah. And, uh, being a seasoned entrepreneur, you earlier on, you listed down four key challenges that, uh, ent- Entrepreneurs and also SME in general, uh, you know, have to ex- expect. One is people. Number two is technology. We have, we should, we, we have discussed earlier. Yes. And number three is finance. And number four is ma- market. We start with people first. How important are people? Absolutely the most important. Um, you know, ask any entrepreneur, they'll say that people is always the biggest challenge. And this is especially so for SMEs. Um, both talent, uh, acquisition and retention. That's mean, how do you hire people and retain them is, is a huge, Headache for many SMEs. We, mm-hmm. we simply do not, um, uh, um, have the capability or the perceived attractiveness as an, as an employer for a majority of good people out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when you graduate, um, many young people are told by their parents, look, go work for a bank, go look for a, 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 a huge company, um, you know, um, Microsoft, etc. Nobody will tell you to go and work for a small company with five people <laughs> or, 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 or yeah. the owner and the wife and that's it, right? No, nobody tells you to do that and nobody wants to do that. So as a result, a lot of time SMEs find problem attracting um, good talents. Mm. And even if you manage to keep, uh, to get them, keeping them is also equally tough. Uh, one, because of money, you, you, you can't compete with the big boys. And secondly, simply because of the know-how uh, in, in employee engagement, 
in in talent management uh, many SMEs don't focus on that uh, mm-hmm. you don't have enough time talking about your stuff uh, you, you know you, you're out there um, trying to survive on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. so um, a lot of governments and Singapore has done a fantastic job a lot of focus on the CDG the capability development grant is on talent development um, to encourage SMEs to have uh, employee engagement uh, plans in place um, to, to become not just a local employer but you, you may be small you may have 5 staff 10 staff 15 staff but you need to act and and behave like a big boy you need to have world class employment practices mm. and that is something that Singapore government is encouraging the SMEs to, to do and locally I think uh, we are lagging behind uh, to some extent in, in, in that uh, you, you have the talent corp of, of course that is formed to try and uh, stem the uh, talent outflow but a lot of work so far has been for MNCs and, and larger companies uh, GLCs, government linked companies uh, for example uh, what about the SMEs? Yeah. What is being done to help SMEs in the country to attract good talents? Uh, where are the first class honours degree people going? What, what can you suggest to the Malaysian government if you think you know, if you think that uh, uh, it is important for them you know, to grow and to get to attract all this talent. I think if, if, if your objective is to grow the SMEs and you want to even the playing ground, then you really need to do something about, about attracting talents, um, here. One example could be a mechanism where you can, um, you can, um, do a core grant for, for EPF. For example, you know, if, even for large company, you get 13% from the company. What's stopping the government from saying, look, you know, if you work for an SME, uh, we top at 1% of an EPF. So that makes a difference. So, uh, you know, talents will start looking at that and say, hey, from a financial point of view, you know, the gap is not so big after all. That's one. And secondly, we need to refocus a lot of our capability building um, programs from from technology, from market access, from helping people to be world, world-class players to getting the basic strike. And that is how do you get them to understand um, uh, the world-class talent acquisition retention strategies? How do you become a good employer? Uh, very few people understand that. Uh, very few SMEs understand that. I think it is the job of the government to try and, and bridge that gap. You know, I provide see. the training, provide the incentive, provide the programs to incentivize uh, SMEs to become better employers. Yeah, and SMEs also suffer from lack of uh, s- clear structure compared to MNC in terms of the way it mm. manages its staff. I, um, maybe it is to, something to, that... To some extent, that's mm. very much so. Mm. Uh, a lot of people say that being SMEs means you are more, you're smaller, therefore you're more nimble mm. and you're able to move faster and, and you're more agile than everybody else. Mm. But that also means that you, you lack the support structure that many larger companies has. So for someone who has been working for an MNC for, say, 10, 20 years, you would never want to work for an, uh, for an SME simply because the support structure that you had uh, when you're working for a larger company is simply not there uh, when you work for an SME. Uh, in larger companies, you may have a, a secretary pool to help you do the photocopying, uh, even apply for leave, you know, everything's online and so on. I mean, go to an SME, everything is, is, is on paper. You can even apply for leave, you fill up a form, uh, you know, photocopy something. Everything is so hands on, like, yeah, for the know, employees. Exactly. If you mm. want coffee, you go down to the nearest 7 Eleven, you buy yourself. And that doesn't happen in larger companies. So mm. there's a huge gap in there. Yeah. Having said that, I think, um, you know, despite SMEs, um, being smaller, it doesn't mean that you as an SME cannot be and act like a big boy. Mm. You know, uh, like at, at Business Media International, that's my company, right? Um, uh, for example, um, we may be small, but uh, we have about 70 staff in, in our care office. Uh, but, but we try and act as if we are an employer of 300 people. Mm-hmm. So we provide, for example, now every Monday we have a, a free breakfast um, so that everybody gets and, and breakfast is free for everyone. We have a subsidy for gym to encourage the staff to... And, uh, the, the nearest gym center to where we are is extremely happy because half our staff are members now uh, because of our gym subsidy. Uh, we have, we have company trips. We have got learning programs, uh, on the first Saturday of every month where we try to get someone to come in here and, and provide learning lessons for everyone. Um, so it's little, little efforts like this, uh, that make a difference. And I think if, if we can do it, so can a lot of SMUs do yeah. it. A lot of people, I mean, uh, graduates, especially when they, they, they ca- go out from, they go out from their university. The first thing that they would imagine a company that they would want to work 
with is you know company like Google's where all their Absolutely. welfare is being taken care of yep. you know and being it's not just about the salary but it's also about the working environment so um about the working environment in uh SME it is probably something that a lot of the graduates felt that it is not what they would one desire <laughs> to it's, be not a, it's not an aspirational industry yeah. this way. Uh, but that is changing. A lot of uh, um, uh, young people are no longer just attracted to the money. Um, mm-hmm. Simply because a lot of our people now, you know, the economy has, has done well, parents are making money and the children are very comfortable uh, uh, these days. So at the top of mind, is not necessarily money an, anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of SMEs need to understand that employee engagement is absolutely important. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if you as an SME are able to provide opportunities that the larger companies cannot, you're able to place them in a place of trust. Um, you place them in, 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 in a place of opportunity of being able to do things that they can't in larger companies. A lot of, uh, younger, uh, talents will be happy to consider SMEs. Yeah. As I mean, in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the successful, um, uh, entrepreneurs today, uh, um, were employees in, uh, companies where at that time, it wasn't such a huge company. Sure. They haven't become an MNC yet. And I think the best example that uh, the person that I admire is Sheryl Sandberg. She was with Google before Google was, you know, the Google, Google that we know yeah. now. Yeah. She was one of the earliest employees. Yeah. So it shows that um, the opportunity might not be financial opportunity, but it would be in terms of you get more hands-on experience and especially learning the traits. Which, so. is, which is why we, we always advise uh, young graduates to be very open-minded. Um, don't don't fear businesses that are small uh, because, like you said, you know, mm. um, the learning opportunities there. Uh, mm. Don't worry about getting your hands dirty because it is getting your hands dirty that provides the biggest uh, lessons in life. Mm-hmm. Secondly, uh, uh, we uh, you you mentioned about finance as the key, one of the key challenges. So, so yeah, so we, we we talk about talent. We talk about um, uh, technology. technology early on. Um, mm. Finance is equally one of the roadblocks where SMEs mm-hmm. are concerned. Um, there, a, since, since the regional financial crisis back in 2007, 2008, there's, um, there's a lot of um, uh, assumption that there's a credit crunch uh, regionally, especially for SMEs who require fundings to expand overseas, whether it is uh, acquisition of buildings, whether it is uh, expanding operations, financing their the exports and so on. And to some extent, that is very true. Uh, banks are a lot more careful these days than, than they were uh, a, a mere seven, eight years ago. And, and that's absolutely important because, um, you know, bank has to learn from the lesson of the financial mm-hmm. crisis and, and they've tightened their, their requirements and so on. That is absolutely important, uh, to understand. So what, but where does that leave SMEs, uh, who require money to grow? Uh, which is why we always advocate, uh, from the grounds up. People need to understand, uh, where they are, where they want, where they want to go. And and learn that every step that they make today will affect how they be built in five years, ten years, twenty years time. Um, and that is called the credit history. Uh, if you make a mistake now, you you stop paying your uh, your suppliers. Uh, that will come haunting you uh, in years to come. So the credit crunch, so to speak, is not as bad as a lot of people perceive it. Uh, so it is more an issue of integrity, an issue of uh, how you manage your business, and people can can do well in these two areas. Uh, there's no reason why banks will not come after you rather than you going after them. Mm. Uh, in terms of finance, how easy is this for SME to get loans from banks, especially big banks? I think it really depends on on uh, what the purpose of your loan is for, mm. uh, the history uh, of your company and, your, and of yourself as an individual. Um, again, there's a lot of perception that banks are not there to help SMEs. Mm-hmm. But if you start talking to the bankers, it's a different picture altogether. Uh, giving out loans is absolutely the, the, the main business for most banks. Um, so there's no reason why banks would, you know, um, purposely withhold financing, um, a good venture. So it all boils down to, to what you have in mind and how you convince your banker that, um, you have the ability to pay, um, and, and that your project is going to be a success. Yeah. Do you, can you name any particular banks that are working at uh, enhancing the SME sector? I think in, in mm-hmm. Malaysia, uh, we're fortunate we have the SME Bank. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a government initiative. Um, there, are, there are grants, uh, not even, sorry, not grants, but government uh, back schemes uh, where the interest rate is lower than, um, than, than other banks, uh, where the government uh, come in, step in, and provide the, the, the collateral if, if 
you know, so required by SMEs to do not have the collateral. We also have the ZGC who has been operating for a number of years. There's a credit uh, guarantee corporation uh, that able to provide the um, the guarantee to banks um, uh, for the very small fee. Uh, should you require collaterals uh, to pledge to the bank? So that that comes in the form of a of of a guarantee from CGC. Mm-hmm. So we we have um, um, these systems in place. We have these facilities in place. Um, the question really is uh, for the SMEs to to go out there and and and, and get it, uh, and more importantly to understand themselves and 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 their journey, so that when they start applying for for financing facilities, you know. Yeah, and, and we always say that um, in in entrepreneurship, um, that you only go to the bank as a last resort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the best way to to finance your business is really to uh, through three things. Uh, one is what we call the OPM. That's mm-hmm. other people's money. <laughs> uh, and, and for young entrepreneurs, that could mean uh, your friends, your families, your parents, and so on. You know, use their money for God's sake, and mm-hmm. if, if they're giving it to you, um, and. And use money from your clients. So a lot of time uh, when you're out doing business, um, you know, collect upfront from clients who are bigger, and, and you'll be surprised that uh, people do pay upfront uh, mm-hmm. in a sense and use those money. So and, and there's no financing costs. Uh, there's no interest rate. You don't have to repay. Uh, I mean, you have to eventually, but you don't have to repay the way you do if you borrow from a bank. So only use a bank as a last resort, and if you can't um, go anywhere else. Yeah, and avoid alongs. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I think I think that's true. Uh, don't ever borrow from any illegal uh, money lenders. Uh, mm. you, you simply regret it. Uh, you may think that, uh, you know, big big entrepreneurs. Many of us are very op- uh, optimistic. We think that if we borrow um, um, ten dollars today, um, we won't have any problem paying back twenty dollars tomorrow. Uh, some a lot of time we overestimate our own ability to make money. Mm, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, and uh, talking about finance, uh, uh, besides that. We, you know, we as an entrepreneur, I think the key challenge, <laughs> I think this is even even much more greater than uh, the other challenges is, is there a market for, for your product? I mean, even if you invested a lot of money and yep. you have the right people, you have the right technology, yep. but if there's no market, then, you know, you're gone. I think business has become increasingly sophisticated. Uh, it wasn't like a uh, 100 years ago or 50 mm-hmm. years ago or 20 years ago during our parents' time. Um, simply because uh, very f- few niches are to be found these days in in business. Whatever you're gonna do, somebody else is doing it. So then the challenge really is to um, to ask yourself if you have something to add value to. If whatever proposition that you have adds value to an um, to to your client, then you ha- should have no fear about um, going into the market. Um, Facebook, for example, um, came came in at a point when they were already MySpace. Uh, and locally, you know, if you remember those days, it was this Frankster, um, Frankster, and Amoy dot com. Uh, <laughs> they they is, will be probably is, earlier uh, than <laughs> ten, more than ten years. Probably, yeah. uh, so, and and yet, Facebook can become a success mm-hmm. uh, if you manage to to find a niche that, uh, and you manage to find value. So it's not even the finding niche, but really adding value to to. Um, um, to whatever industry that you're operating in. So, but what value you you ask? Um, um, it it really depends. So, so it is up to you as an entrepreneur to to determine if you're adding value to to the equation. If you're not, then then sure, it is going to be the toughest journey you ever take in your life. So, uh, talking about market, uh, in Malaysia, what is the biggest market right now that people should invest, especially SME? I would, I would. Um, be very wealthy if I have a crystal ball and we predict that. But I would say any market is uh, is equally good. There's a lot of fallacy. People say that um, again that uh, there's certain magic market that if you go into it you make billions out of it. Uh, some people say let's go into property. Um, uh, that's where the big money is. Some people say go into finance. That's where the money is. Some people say go to technology and and social media. That's where the money is. Um, I think as an entrepreneur, we have learned uh, over the years that there's really no such thing as a magic bullet to success. Uh, every industry, you can find successful people. Uh, one example is, uh, you know, uh, the, the chocolate market. Who mm-hmm. would think making chocolate could be such a huge market, right? I mean, chocolate, everybody makes chocolate. You go to Belgium, uh, everybody on the street makes chocolate. Uh, it's a very traditional art. Uh, people make chocolate at home and so on. But look at Cadbury. Uh, that's sort of as an SME as well. Uh, today they're the, they're the billion dollar company. Uh, so and they sell it. And what do they sell? Chocolate, um, generally. So who would think um, that that somebody who sells chocolate can be so successful? Same thing with Starbucks. 
coffee chain. I mean, look at the, the amount of marmarks that we have, uh, mm-hmm. you know, our old town, our, our coffee shop and so on. We, we've got plenty of this kind of thing and everybody do, does exactly the same thing. So who would think that somebody who sell nothing else but coffee can become a, I think today they had a six billion dollar company. Yeah, they are one of the biggest companies yeah, in, 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 in the, the world. world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- there's really no such thing as the right industry to be in, but, um, whether as I've said, you're adding value or not, whether your rollout is lean and mean, uh, fierce enough, uh, go out there and conquer the market when you get the right people to help you manage uh, that growth. So there's a lot of things uh, that goes inside the equation. Um, so, so the least thing that we want to worry about is really, uh, am I in the right industry? Because mm-hmm. if, if you have doubt about that, then, then really you are in the wrong industry. Mm. And also, um, uh, when it comes to market, it is not something that is like so fixed, isn't it? It is something that you have to be at the right time, at the right place at the right time, or well, how it, is it? it? That's one way to to put it. I think one of the things that we all should 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 learn and learn early is not to just copy somebody else who's mm-hmm. successful. Uh, and, and that's something that a lot of people do. Um, um, for example, somebody work in a um, web development company. Next thing you know, you have you know the, the staff going out there and doing up similar thing to their to their former bosses. And that happens a lot in 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 this region in in, in South East. Asia, where people simply do what they think they're they're good at, but that is not necessarily the best way to do business. If you look at the mama, you know that we have um, uh, for, yeah. uh, as an example, you will find mama springing up in, in every corner. You find one that is extremely successful at at at, at the uh, the corner of the street, and you find another one that has got absolutely no customer on the other end of the street. Same street, two corners, mm-hmm. wow. you know, and and you have got one successful mama and one that is absolutely has no customer. Why does that happen? Um, simply because everyone thinks that you know Mama is a profitable business, so everybody go into it. Everybody's exactly the same thing. No one is adding value, so mm. as a result, somebody has to fail. Mm, okay. Uh, talking about market itself, on a more regional um, sort of bird's eye view, we have the ASEAN Economic Community, yep. and one of the key area is uh, to create a free trade zones uh, within the Southeast Asian region. So how how can SME sector benefit from this? Uh, it, 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 it's not exactly a free trade zone. Um, there, there is a schedule here uh, where some countries who are least developed uh, are opening the market a bit um, a bit slower than the rest. And there's some sectors that have been mutually agreed to be um, to be protected um, uh, because of the strategic importance, um, because of the size of the market in respect to the respective economy and so on. Um, but what we really want to do is to achieve a single... Um, corridor where when you sell any products that are within the list or, or rather products that are not within that prohibited list um, that you will no longer require um, to go through the uh, the usual tariff that uh, you have to prior to AEC this one and secondly of course the free movement of labor of, mm-hmm. of skilled labor so uh, somebody who who has a degree or has a proven ability to do something a skilled worker in a sense will be able to work anywhere else in ASEAN um, without any without requiring the the usual tedious uh, working visa task, working visa oh, and yeah. so on you still have to apply um, to respective government, but the mechanism is in place uh, or should be in place by next year to enable seamless integration in that sense. So there's going to be a lot of movement of people, a lot of movement of products, of trade, of services, of company uh, coming in 2015. Um, but if you look at the entire AEC, you see that in to some extent it's very much designed for the larger boys, people who who has the capability, the reach, the, the people, the size, the scale to go beyond their local market, the banks, for example. The, the utilities company, the, um, the manufacturers, uh, that has already done mm. their first billion dollar, for example, who now say, no, I, I want to go into the Indonesian market, the Indonesian want to come to Malaysian market. So that leaves the SMEs, uh, way behind. So SMEs, we have to be, um, to recognize, uh, the AEC as what it is. It is both an opportunity and a threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, opportunity because, of course, now being nimble, being small, you're able to, to establish your business uh, anywhere in Asia. There's very mm-hmm. little uh, hindrance uh, coming in 2015. Uh, huge opportunity. People start to recognize uh, the whole region as a market. People are less mm-hmm. hesitant. Um, uh, protect- protectionism is coming down. Uh, people are less hesitant to buy your products because you come from another ASEAN country. So that's a huge opportunity moving forward, but it's also an immense threat. Yeah, I, I guess it's the the competition well. is uh, much more it, larger, it's, right? It's, it's going to be it's going to double, um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to say the least. Uh, if you're doing 
a radio station, for example, you're going to find all of a sudden you're going to be competing with a thousand other radio stations. If you're doing, uh, if you're manufacturing a instant noodle, um, um, in a packet, for example, all of a sudden now you see another, um, five, five countries coming in, um, and people who are industry leaders in their respective country with the financial muscle are now coming in. Um, to try and take the market share away from you. Mm. So, so yes, it is both an opportunity as a threat and SMEs need to, of all people, to be prepared uh, for 2015. We mm. need to understand what it is all about. We need to understand what capability we have right now and how do we protect mm. our market share so, moving forward. So uh, people can get more information about you know how to prepare themselves in the SME Expo as well, right? Absolutely. So that's one of the topics uh, that we are discussing uh, at the SME Summit. Uh, and yes, um, th- there's going to be a lot of vendors who are out to help uh, SMEs. Mm, that's good. And uh, my last question, uh, going back to SME Magazine, you have a few uh, interesting activities within your organization uh, as itself. And one of it is the SME Awards. Can you explain more about it? I think what we have done really is to position ourselves as a, um, as, as a supporter of SMEs. Uh, being SMEs ourselves, and uh, and we started the SME 100 Awards in um, um, 2009 as well, um, really to highlight and to showcase successful SMEs, people who were previously, um, um, you know, overlooked by other media, overlooked by even the government, overlooked by even their own um, peers in industry. So we want to highlight these people and provide the opportunity to grow further. Uh, and since then, SME 100 has, has grown regionally. Uh, we now have the SME 100 in Indonesia. Uh, we've launched SME 100, uh, North Malaysia. That's the Penang, Para, Police, Kedah, uh, Northern Corridor region, uh, last year. Uh, this year, and this is actually next month, uh, we, we are introducing the SME 100 East Malaysia. We're holding our first, um, awards ceremony and results presentation night, uh, on the 1st May, uh, 2014 in Kota Kinabalu. Um, so to, to, to some extent, the SME 100 Awards has, has grown, um, to, to help more SMEs to be discovered and to provide the opportunity to excel. I see. Well, all the best, uh, Dr. William Ng, uh, for the SME Expo and also your SME, uh, um, SME magazine. Any last words? Uh, yes, absolutely. So if, if you want to have, uh, to get more information and explore, again, as I've said, uh, we see us at SME Export Asia. Uh, also come and uh, subscribe to us on SME Magazine.Asia. Uh, lots of information, um, there for SMEs. Okay. Thank you for being with us in Durian ASEAN. You're welcome. Thank you.